Praise the Lord, church. I hope whenever you're watching this, it finds you well, whether morning, evening, or afternoon. I'm privileged to bring this lesson to you today. We're talking about contending for the faith in our Sunday school lessons. And today we're going to talk about faith that reaches to others. I just want to start by opening with prayer, if you would pray with me for this Sunday school lesson. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the faith that you give us. I thank you, Lord, that we can build our lives on faith in you. And I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to open our hearts, our minds to your word, that you would teach us, Lord, to contend for the faith and to have a faith that inspires and reaches to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture focus for today is found in the book of Jude. It's only one chapter, so that makes it easy. Our scripture focuses verses 17 to 23, and I know we've used verse 3 in our earlier lessons, but I like it so much I wanted to include it as well. So Jude verse 3 says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Verse 17 says, But dear friends, Remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ were told. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear. And that phrase caught me a little bit. And that word in verse 23, fear, it means dread and terror, like we would think of it. But it also means reverence for one's husband. And when I think about it in that context of Christ, who is the church's bridegroom, who is my spiritual husband, show mercy to others mixed with a reverence for God. And let that faith, that reverence be what pushes you to reach out to others and show them the mercy of God. When I think of faith and revival, faith that reaches to others, I think of the church in the book of Acts. That's to me, the example of contending for the faith. This early church, or where we started, however you would describe it, is exactly where this lesson begins. So thankfully we're all on the same page. And it was this New Testament church that was started in the fire. The book of Acts begins as a sequel to the book of Luke. Luke is the author of both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And he alludes to his Gospel in in the first verse of Acts chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Acts is really a recap and a wrap-up of the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. And Jesus' ascension into heaven is how the book opens. So Luke 24 ends with this account, and Acts 1 begins with it. And in this dialogue, Jesus gives the command to the disciples and to his faithful followers to go to Jerusalem and wait. And that had to take a lot of faith in and of itself. Because if you look on your calendar, it's about 40 days from Easter to Pentecost. And Jesus gave no time frame of waiting. He didn't say, hey, wait for five days, wait for a week, 10, a month, nothing. He said, just wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait. And I can be patient, but I really, really don't like to wait especially if I have no idea how long it's going to be. If you can tell me it'll be about an hour or two, a few days, it's a lot easier for me to be patient in that situation. But if it's just wait, that is a test of my faith and my patience. I think of all of the questions, the boredom, obligations, all of the annoyances that can come up in 40 days time. And it might have been the longest 40 days of their lives. We often hear that faith is an active thing. And they had to fulfill the act of waiting. But besides that, this is a pretty passive command. They're just waiting for something. And that had to be difficult. Sometimes it's easier if they give you a command, go do this. That would be easier to fulfill than just wait. But maybe in this, 
we see the lessons, the message, and the purpose of Jesus beginning to be understood. Because this is the same group who thought that Jesus was going to work according to their plans and in a way that made sense to them. This is how he's going to do it. I can see it already. He's going to overthrow the Romans. We're good. Guys, let's go. But when that didn't happen, in fact, when nothing that they expected happened, they ran away. They got scared. When Jesus didn't work according to their time frame, according to their plans, they ran away in fear. But now, in the book of Acts, they follow instructions. And they do something that might not have made a lot of sense to them at the time. And in this, we can see the growth of their faith and their trust in God. In Acts chapter 1, they're given the command to gather and to wait. While they're waiting, they elect Matthias to take the place of Judas among the 12 apostles. In Acts chapter 2, this is the famous chapter, the Holy Ghost is poured out and revival hits Jerusalem. This is the first time the church declares the message of Jesus with Peter in Acts chapter 2. And then, immediately following this in Acts 3, things start to get really interesting. Because Peter and John are walking to the temple, and they see a lame man at the temple, and the man asks for money. And Peter's response tells you that they did not look wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. He tells them, look at us. Do we look like we have money? Acts chapter 2 calls them unlearned and ignorant. And then in Acts chapter 3, we find out that they're poor. By our standards or by society standards, it might not have seemed like they had a lot to offer. But it was their faith that turned the world upside down. This great faith that causes Peter in Acts chapter 3 and verse 6 to say to this man, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man is healed, the people are amazed, and a general uproar ensues at the temple. So Peter takes the opportunity and preaches to the crowd again. He preaches Jesus. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees find out what's going on. They show up. And they arrest Peter and John for disturbing the peace. Well, Peter's not done yet. He turns around and preaches to them, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He preaches Jesus again. And the rulers, the religious rulers, they really don't know what to do with Peter and John. Because all the people are praising God and saying it's a miracle. This man is over 40. He's been lame. We all know he's lame. And now here he is. He's healed. And they're going on and on about this miracle. So the Pharisees are faced with losing political and religious control with one wrong move. And it kind of reminds me of Jesus' ministry when they all say, well, if we answer his question this way, they all think John was a prophet. They'll be offended at our answer. They're stuck in this quandary now with these guys who are followers of Jesus. So they call Peter and John in. They release them, but they command them not to speak of or teach about Jesus. Y'all can go. Just stop what you're doing. Stop talking about Jesus. And in Acts chapter 4 verse 21, we see the response and what happens. So when they had further threatened them, Peter and John, when they had threatened Peter and John, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. So after these threats and warnings, strong suggestions, they let Peter and John go. And they go back to the rest of the church believers and share with them what had happened. And the response of the early church is astonishing. And I say astonishing to me because this group has relatively no history with Jesus. They're brand new at this point in time. Some of the church, like Peter and John, had been with Jesus for three years. But that's not very inspiring. It had only been three years. And not all of the church had had that time with Jesus. So they really are in uncharted waters for a young church. They have a command from Jesus. They have an experience from the day of Pentecost. And they have a group of believers, the church. That's it, really. Yet they are all filled with boldness and courage in the face of adversity. They didn't need a heritage to have boldness for the kingdom of God because it comes on them. And we see their prayer in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. This is the prayer that they give. And now, Lord, 
Behold their threatenings, they're talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Their response is that they have church, in whatever random room they're assembled in, they all met up somewhere, and they have church. The faith of Peter and John was contagious. They came back full of faith instead of fear. And the believers ask for boldness instead of being afraid or being intimidated. And heaven backs up their requests. The place where they were gathered was shaken by the power of God. The people were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak the word with boldness. They received what they asked for. And then a spirit of unity comes on the church. And that's where it begins. The book of Acts tells us that they shared their possessions for the good of the group. If someone was in need, they sacrificed to meet that need. And it's just like God to go above and beyond for his people. They asked for boldness. They made one request. They just asked the Lord for boldness. But he gives them a demonstration. He gives them a Holy Ghost experience again. He gives them boldness and he gives them unity. So out of that one request, Lord, give us boldness. He goes above and beyond to demonstrate his power and increase their faith. We see in the early church how our faith can affect the faith of others. Peter and John had an impact on early believers through their faith in the face of persecution. Contending for the faith by facing our fears has an impact on the faith of others. When we have courage and stand for our faith, that resonates with others because everyone is facing their own fears. It might be different from mine, but everyone is facing a fear of some kind. Peter and John at this point are the church elders. They had the most experience. They had three years with Jesus. And so these are the guys that you go to because they must know what to do. They were with Jesus. And we can see the growth in Peter in his faith from when he denied Jesus up to this point. The Spirit of God did a work in Peter that gave him the courage to stand for what he believed instead of just trying to survive or get by through his own means. In the Gospels, when Peter's confronted, weren't you with Jesus? He, no, no, I don't even know him. And he denies Jesus. But now, in the face of intense pressure, Peter stands and declares Jesus. He stands in faith instead of fear. The fuel for faith is found in knowing that we aren't trying to conquer our fears alone. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. We don't face fear alone. We have a power that works within us. This lesson shares five principles to help guide us in having contagious faith or faith that reaches others. The first principle is the principle of information. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 16 says, Every prudent or every wise man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. Now faith is not ignoring the facts. It's not idealism or naivety. It's all, that's all ignorance. It's not faith. I don't need faith at that point because I don't know. I can't, it's not requiring faith if I don't know how bad the situation is or if I'm just ignoring the facts. That's just ignorance. Faith instead is based on knowing the situation and moving forward because the belief is stronger than the fear. I'm reminded of Paul's words in Romans chapter 8 when he says, For I am persuaded, I'm convinced, in spite of all the facts, I have enough information, and I am persuaded that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Think of the great acts of faith. Of David and Goliath was mentioned, Daniel in the lion's den, the three Hebrew boys, or Jesus raising Lazarus from, Lazarus from the dead. None of these examples were based on ignorance. Jesus was fully aware that Lazarus had been dead for three days. 
And it's not them simply ignoring the facts. Well, maybe it'll just work out if we just, or maybe we'll just ignore it, pretend it didn't happen, and maybe everything will work out. No, each of these individuals made a choice for faith. They were not acting without knowledge. They were acting despite knowledge. They had made a choice for faith. No one had more clarity, understanding, wisdom, knowledge, whatever you want to say, than Jesus. And he still worked in the realm of the miraculous and supernatural that goes beyond human logic and facts. He moved in the area of faith. And that's where we're called to work as well. The second principle is the principle of evaluation. And there's nothing unscriptural or unspiritual about evaluating a situation and weighing the pros and cons of that situation. Otherwise, again, it's not faith, it's just ignorance. We really don't understand what we're getting into. Luke chapter 14, verses 18, excuse me, 28 through 31 say, For which of you... Intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that will begin, all that behold it will begin to mock him. He'll, he'll get started, and they'll say, you remember that guy, he laid the foundation of the tower, but he didn't have enough money to finish it, and it'll be a big joke. Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? It's an exercise in futility if you're not trying to see, well, is this even possible? If you're not counting the cost. Everything we believe has a price tag. In fact, I think we could say it has several different price tags, depending on the situation or the season of life that you're in. So therefore, it's wise to count the cost. And that's not a lack of faith. In fact, it makes a case for our faith. When we believe in something that is right and has eternal value and make the choice to sacrifice and follow that belief, a well-informed decision, that's faith that's contagious, that will reach to others. Faith increases because it's worth it. And we are a testimony that it's worth it. There are some things that when they're evaluated, they're just not worth the cost or not worth the risk, we might say. But those things that are eternal and of eternal value, things that build others up, those are things that are worth the cost. Value increases faith. Look at all these things that the scripture says are added when you believe. Evaluate that. If I put my faith in Christ, all of these things are then added to me. God is with me. He's a healer, a savior, a friend, a shelter, a comfort, a hope, and the list goes on and on. And evaluating my faith, it then shows me the value of my faith. In evaluation, I can find out truly what my faith is worth. What is the value of what I believe? The third principle is the principle of preparation. And faith is not an exercise of emotion trumping logic or just a knee-jerk reaction to a feeling that's not based on careful planning. Now, often we do respond in the moment or we're quickened in the moment to do something and we have to act on faith. And that is the case many times. But that process of faith, what got you to that point, begins long before that moment ever arose. We talk about a leap of faith and that is accurate. But faith is not making a commitment that I know I can't keep and just trusting God to take care of my mess. Well, Lord, I have not prepared for this. I haven't done any, there's nothing I can do. I'm just gonna trust you, Lord. That's irresponsible. I don't go and try to buy a car if I don't think I can make the monthly payments. That's irresponsible. And there are moments of faith that I have to say, you know what? I've done what I can do, Lord, and now I have to trust you. And that is right. We do have to take a leap of faith, but it's not with a lack of preparation. God directs us through preparation and then blesses that work or directs us to make it bigger than we could have ever imagined on our own. Well, I thought I was just going to do this little thing, God. That's what I prepared for. But now you're telling me it's going to be this huge thing. And I have to trust him that he's going to make it what he wants it to be, even though it's different than what I thought. 
most of the moments in my life where I've had to act in faith or I felt the Lord lead me to step out, it's been a very sober and serious conversation with the Lord where we went through all of these principles, information, evaluation, preparation, all of it. Specifically, I thought of one example in my life. There was an, an impromptu missions offering that um, happened in a service. And this, the preacher who was leading asked all of us to pray and asked the Lord to lead us in what amount we should give. And at, at the time, I was just out of college, so I have all my bills, my student loans, that good stuff. And I was saving for a missions trip on top of that. And so here I am with all of this on my mind, evaluating and praying as to asking the Lord what I should give. And I thought of an amount and I thought it must be the Lord. And I was so excited because I knew that that amount that I had thought of would not hinder my savings for the missions trip at all. Like, okay, I'll just, just, you know, but we can, we can recoup from that. It's fine. That's not going to put my missions trip in danger at all. This is great. And so I'm overjoyed and whatever. And I start thanking the Lord for my job and thank you Lord for blessing me that I have this money and that I've saved. And so I can bless other people. And you know, I, I can still go on my missions trip and thank you Lord that I just have all this flexibility with my money. And then the Lord spoke and said, what amount would be uncomfortable for you to give? And I didn't answer out loud because I know how that works. As soon as you say it, that's what, you know, I was like, hmm, you're not going to catch me in that one, Lord. I'm not going to say it. But I did instantly think of an amount. And for some reason, I thought the Lord would just ignore it. Or maybe he hadn't noticed that I had thought of an amount, that it would be a secret. But the Lord did not ignore it. And he wasn't unaware of what amount had popped in my head. And he said, that's the amount that I want you to give. And my very submissive and faith-filled self said, oh, Shayla. Why did you open your big mouth? Like, what were you thinking? And that was a moment for me that faith was very clear-eyed. And it was part of a very honest conversation. It was, the conversation went a little longer. I, I'm sad to say I was not fully submissive and just said, yes, Lord, whatever. I said, Lord, I have this mission strip I'm trying to raise money for. I don't think you understand the situation. And tried to explain. So we had a very honest conversation about this moment, about what this was going to cost me. And eventually it did require a leap of faith on my part. I did submit to the Lord and it was not because it was impossible. It wasn't an amount of money that there was, I had no idea how it was going to happen. I knew I could make it happen, but because it might get in the way of something that I wanted to do, that it might require a sacrifice. I followed the Lord by faith. Lord, if you want me on this mission trip, you're going to make it happen. And he did. I can't tell you how the money got there. Nobody gave me a huge check or anything. But when I needed to make the payments to go on the missions trip, the money was always there. Because I had faith and followed the Lord in that moment. In that preparation, that preparing up to that point of trying to be a good steward of my resources prepared me to take that leap of faith with the Lord when he asked me to. And God is in the business of doing the impossible. We shouldn't shy away from big prayers or asking for things by faith that are promised by God, but we have absolutely no idea how it's going to work out. But faith isn't a one-stop shop to get out of a mess or get what we want to make ourselves look good. When a moment requires a step of faith that I haven't prepared for, my prayers become one of desperation, not of faith. God, just do something, please, because I'm not prepared at all. You're just, you're going to have to do all of it because I can't do any of it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah had a word from God, but he still had to take a leap of faith. The man has never seen rain before. He's never even heard of it. No one has heard of it. Have you heard this thing called rain? No, no idea. The, you know, the water just comes up from the ground and waters the earth. That's it. I don't know what this falling from the sky stuff is. And now the word from God says everyone's in danger of being destroyed by this thing that no one's ever heard of and no one's ever seen just because God said so. So what good is Noah's faith in this situation if all he does is preach and warn for decades, but he doesn't build 
the ark. He could have believed God's word would come to pass and still missed out on the saving of his house because he failed to prepare for what God's word said would happen. Noah was called by God to prepare for an event that he had to accept by faith would happen. I can prepare my heart and my mind by practicing trusting the Lord in every situation. I prepare myself for those leaps of faith by learning to rely on the Lord and leaning on him in everyday life, building trust and relationship with the Lord. That prepares my mind and my faith to take those big leaps when God asks me to, because it's already become a habit at that point. My preparation and trust in God takes my faith from passive faith to active faith that I can then demonstrate to others. The fourth principle is the principle of declaration. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20, Jesus was talking to his disciples. They were asking, Lord, why can't we perform these miracles like you perform? And this is the answer in verse 20. Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Jesus challenges his disciples in this verse to cultivate faith that will cause them to speak to mountains or obstacles, having faith that they will be removed. There's no point in speaking if you don't think it's going to happen anyway. For faith to be spread, it must be spoken or expressed. If I sit or stand by silently, my faith has no impact. I uh, watched an interview of Corey Tim Boom one time. She was recounting something miraculous that had happened in her life. She was telling how the Lord had provided it. And the man she was telling was awestruck. He couldn't believe that this had happened. And he was a believing man. And finally, at one point, she turned and looked at him and said, you know, we shouldn't be too surprised when the Lord works and does what we ask him to do. And that's, I think, the spirit of Matthew 17. When you ask for it, you should ask, believing that it's going to happen. That spoken faith reinforces our own resolve. It reinforces my resolve. And that's an inward act. But then it acts outwardly. It ignites a faith in others. And if our dialogue and conversation are full of anxious, negative thoughts, we shouldn't be surprised to find ourselves full of fear and lacking faith. And then we will be shocked if the Lord decides to move in a miraculous way. But if we're speaking in faith and expecting it, then we're looking for that. We're looking and awaiting for the Lord to act in a way that's miraculous. We don't ignore the information from principle number one, but we make a choice for faith. We choose to believe what God's word says. That if God says he'll work all things for his people, then in the midst of all kinds of crazy and messed up situations, I have faith in God working because I trust his word and I believe he'll do it. Not because everything's okay or because I think everything's okay and I've stuck my head in the sand, but because I believe his word and I've chosen to put my trust in him. Scripture instructs us to lift our eyes, not physically, but think of the principle. When you lift your eyes or look at something, when you focus on it, usually you'll find yourself moving toward that thing. This is especially true in driving. So that would be a fun experiment for everyone to try is just go out and drive and look at the opposite side of the road that you're supposed to be driving on and see what happens in that case. My uncle Leo had bought a car and he saw his neighbor and was waving to his neighbor to show them his nice new car. And suddenly the neighbor started running away and he couldn't figure out why. Because while he was looking at his neighbor, he started moving towards his neighbor and suddenly they were in fear for their life. But as we focus on something, that's what we're going to move towards, both spiritually and physically. When I lift my eyes, I need to lift my voice as well and speak faith, life, speak words of encouragement, speak scripture if nothing else comes to mind. Jude says, build up your most holy faith. And we do that through our words. God's promises build faith and courage. So we must declare them. That is part of my act of faith. The fifth principle is the principle of initiation. And many times we take care of everything else, one through four, but our faith still falls flat. And why is that? Well, it might be because we do not initiate. We want God to open the door and do all of the heavy lifting, 
and get, take care of everything while we just walk through and look really nice and smile. And maybe that's not y'all, but I find myself there. That I want to be Vanna White just pointing out all of the stuff that God is doing. Isn't this great? Isn't this nice? Isn't this wonderful? Well, I'm not having to take responsibility for any of it. And I'm not having to partner with God at all. He's the one on the line, not me. Isn't this wonderful? And it requires no effort on my part. But Jesus gives instruction in Matthew chapter 7 about our responsibility in the kingdom of God. And they're all action words, if you notice it. Ask, seek, knock. They all require initiative and require something of us. You don't just go to someone's house and stand on the porch until they notice you standing there like a lost puppy and let you in. You knock on the door. You ring the doorbell. You take initiative. And that's the same instruction God gives us. The promise then is that God will give, find, and open, but that only comes after we take the initiative and step out in faith. The first time the children of Israel crossed a body of water was when they came to the Red Sea after they had left Egypt shortly thereafter. And God parted the waters for them. Moses lifted up their hands, parted the waters, done, let's go. Let's go through, on, onward. But then fast forward to when they're at the Jordan River and they're having to cross into the Promised Land. And it goes a little differently this time. God requires something different. He says, I want the priests to take up the ark and walk into the water first. And then I'll part the waters. He required them to take the initiative. Israel, you've seen the miracles. You've heard how I parted waters before. You've seen me do the miraculous before. But now it's your turn to step out in faith. Put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Believing that I'm going to do it again. That if I said you're going to the promised land, you're going to the promised land. I exercise and build my faith by taking the initiative. Fear lives and grows in a place of passivity, but struggles to stay alive with people of action. Faith is contagious when it is exercised, when it's demonstrated or shown to others. And we see this in Peter's life. If we look at Mark chapter 5, which is the account of Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, Peter is one of the only ones in the room with Jesus when this happens. He brings his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, are with Jesus when this miracle happens. And then later, in Acts chapter 9, Peter is faced with a similar situation. It was a chance to exercise his faith. Tabitha, who is a young lady in the church, dies. And the church goes and gets Peter. He was the church elder. He had been with Jesus. Go get Peter. Peter had been with the one who raised the dead. He had seen it firsthand. So he had faith to encourage others that miracles could happen again. The church had to have faith in Peter. This guy must know what to do. Because he was there when these miracles were performed. Then Peter has faith to say, you know what? Jesus performed these miracles. His spirit is inside of me. He's given me a promise. Greater things than these shall you do. And I believe it. So he began by exercising his faith. And then that faith spread like wildfire as God backed up the faith of the early church. Adversity creates an environment that makes strong faith spread to others. It's an environment of need in adversity. It's a place where you need something from God, where you need something that is beyond yourself. And really having to trust the Lord because you can't depend on what you've done before or what's always worked or what you usually do. Well, we've always done it this way before. What are we going to do now that we can't do it that way? And this creates conditions for God to move in unheard of ways. If you want to see God move in a way that's different, you'll find yourself in a very different situation than anything that you've ever been in before. But faith is built up and spread to others when they see God move like they've never seen before. Yeah, I've heard all that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa! I haven't heard that before. I haven't seen that one before. That causes faith to build. And we see this in Acts chapter 16 with Paul and Silas. They ran into this kind of adversity. And the story in Acts 16 is of Paul and Silas going to Philippi. Paul sees in a vision the Macedonian church asking for help. So they go to Philippi to help them. And this possessed woman follows them around, 
declaring these men are servants of the Most High. And she's creating a distraction, really. And Paul finally has had enough. And he turns around and rebukes her and casts the devil out of her. Well, then her masters become angry because they took advantage of this condition to make money for themselves through divination. They would have her divine people's future or things like that. And so these men who own this woman incite a mob against Paul and Silas. They say they're trying to stir up things and they're doing all this stuff and creating general unrest and they should be in jail. And so Paul and Silas are beaten and thrown in jail because of this mob and the action of these men. But Paul and Silas worshipped and sang even though they were hurting and being treated unjustly. It wasn't right, anything that happens to them. At the end of the story, in fact, Paul won't let it go because he says, you chastise us publicly, you put us in jail publicly, you're going to release us publicly too because we're Roman citizens and didn't deserve for this to happen to us. But in the middle of the situation, before we're at the end of the story, they have a midnight praise service. They pray and worship and sing, even though everything is going awful. We're where the Lord told us to be, and now here we are. But they take the moment. They don't lose their faith, and they worship the Lord. Full of faith in adversity, they brought revival to Philippi. There was a spiritual and a physical earthquake that happened. It's a jailbreak. They start singing, an earthquake happens, their bonds are loose, the doors fling open. Great! But everyone stays, which I think is a huge miracle of this story, and we don't have the context for this. Because again, maybe you all have more faith than I do, but if the door opened and my bonds were loose, I might say, thank you, Lord, I'll see you all later, and head out of there. This must be the Lord moving, because... Let's, I'm not, in, I'm not in chains anymore. Let's just take advantage and let's go. It's obviously the Lord. But no one does. No one leaves. And I think they must have followed Paul because Paul stayed and Silas stays. And that's interesting to me because Paul's faith kept him in prison even when the doors swung open. When it looks like this must be salvation, let's make a break for it, boys. He didn't. He sat and he waited. And the result of that decision is that when the jailer wakes up and he runs in and sees all the doors open, he doesn't take stock. He just decides, you know what, all the prisoners have escaped. I'm going to die anyway. I'm just going to take my own life. But Paul saves his life and says, be of good cheer. We're all here. Nobody's gone. And so he saves the jailer's life. The jailer takes Paul and Silas home, treats them bathes their wounds. He gives them a meal. And they preach to the jailer and his household. And the result is that his entire household receives salvation immediately on the spot. And that is faith that reaches to others. It's not a faith that it took a while. It's an immediate transfer of the faith of Paul inspired faith in the jailer to say, what do I have to do to be saved? Situations can produce faith in others and ourselves more efficiently than we can with our words. Paul stood for his faith also in the midst of a storm, and the whole passenger ship, the whole list of passengers on the ship was saved in Acts chapter 27. Paul had appealed to Caesar after being arrested, and I just have to say, Paul's life is a study in faith. If we're talking about contending for the faith, he contended for the faith. And the ship that he's on to go to Caesar encounters a tremendous storm. The book of Acts says there were no sun or stars for many days. And the author says it was no small tempest. This was a big deal. They cast all the non-essentials overboard. And then finally, this is the line of Acts before Paul speaks. All hope we should be saved was then taken away. This is it. This is the end of the line, fellas. There's, there's nothing else we can do we're at the end. There's no more hope. And it's in that moment that Paul stands and delivers a word from the Lord. We will lose the ship, but God will spare our lives. He's promised me this. Acts chapter 27, verse 25, he says, Wherefore, sirs, in light of this promise from God, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. It's a very short speech that he gives. But at the end of it, the crew is full of faith, and they follow Paul. He says, let's eat. We haven't eaten for a while. Let's eat. Just stay on board. Stay on the ship. We're all going to be okay. And they do. They follow him. For two weeks, 
they battle this storm. They try to find land. Should If we find land, should we kill the prisoners? Should we not? How do we safely get the ship to shore when we find land? Now, how do we safely get to shore when we find land? There's all this drama that happens in between. But 276 people are saved because they listened to Paul and caught his faith. He inspired their faith by his trust in God. And not only the sailors on the ship, but also the natives of the island come to believe because of Paul's faith. The island, this island is where Paul is bitten by a poisonous viper as they're gathering firewood. The snake jumps out from the firewood and latches on to Paul, and he just shakes the snake off into the fire. But the natives see that, and they're thinking, okay, something's up. This dude lands on the shore after this massive storm, this huge storm like we've never seen. And then he's the only guy that gets attacked by a snake. Somebody's in trouble. He did something. What did he do? What did he do to anger one of the gods? And they watch him because surely he's going to die. This is his punishment. And it would have been very easy to panic in that situation to say, I just made it through a two-week-long storm, and now I, I'm, I'm taken out by a snake. What in the world? But Paul doesn't even give it a second thought. He keeps his strong faith. God's promise is that I'm going to stand before Caesar. So that's that. I'm going to stand before Caesar. Snake or no snake, storm or no storm, I'm going to stand before Caesar. And he had a faith that caught hold and inspired faith in other people. He didn't waver or worry. And as a result, he changed the minds of even those that were living on the island to the point where they begin to come to him for healing. His adversity became a door for ministry. And adversity becomes a door for our ministry. We just have to see situations through eyes of faith and see the opportunity, not the opposition. Standing in faith through adversity becomes an avenue for others to enter into faith in Jesus and allow him to work in their lives. Jesus was the greatest contender for the faith. I think we could all agree in that. And he stood strong at Calvary, the greatest adversity any man's ever endured, and brought salvation to the world through that adversity. Faith in adversity and sacrifice was the gateway for salvation through faith. And contending for the faith is acting in faith and then allowing that faith to stir a response in others. I want to close with a story. A lot of times I don't do this, but we're talking about spoken faith. And the author of this lesson shares a story of when he was evangelizing. And he was preaching on faith, appropriately enough. And he said, you know, the audience was not with me. They, they were, not, were not there. We weren't connecting. And so I began to pray and ask God to perform a miracle, to, to have some visible act that would increase the faith of the church. And the Lord spoke to me and let me know there was a man in the service who needed to be delivered from nicotine. And he said, I was thanking the Lord. My plan was that, you know, the guy was going to be delivered and he would come and testify after the fact. But the Lord began to speak to him and let him know that he was going to require this man, this preacher, to step out and act in faith. He said, I was directed by the Holy Ghost to a giant of a man in the audience. I stopped preaching and called the man out. I said publicly what the Holy Ghost had told me, that he was addicted to nicotine and could be delivered tonight. And the man lifted his hands and began to cry. I went back to where he was standing and stood on the pew in front of him so I could get my hand on his head. As we prayed, he began to shout and proclaim, proclaim very loudly that he was free. After this, he ran out the back door. I looked around and the pastor looked at me. I did not know what to do next. The man just took off. It appeared the man was gone for good. Soon he came running back in and threw several packs of cigarettes on the floor in the altar area. The man received the Holy Ghost and immediately requested the microphone. I gave him the microphone and he began to share his testimony. He had never been in a church before. Just a few days earlier, his doctor had told him he only had six months to live because of lung cancer. He said as he drove by the church that night, a voice told him to go into the church and he would be healed. He thought it was just his radio he was hearing, but as he came back by the church, he heard the voice again. He said he sat in the parking lot for some time before he got the courage to come in. 
As the prayer was made for his deliverance, he said he felt a warm, soothing sensation come over his body, into his lungs, and up out of his mouth. He declared his healing, and later in the week, his doctors confirmed it. That night, many visitors who were in town for the holidays made their way to God as this man asked, asked them to join him at the front of the building. Several healings and miracles were reported, and many people of different faiths received the Holy Ghost. This man, who had never been to a church before, prayed for people as we had prayed for him, and faith multiplied in that building among the people. I learned a valuable lesson that night. If we operate in faith and not be afraid of the risks, God will take that seed of faith and multiply it to those around us. We contend for the faith by stepping out in faith and allowing our faith to multiply. I pray that we will all contend for the faith and build up a faith that then reaches to others and builds faith in others. God bless you.